Santos, President of IPQ, the National Standardization Body. Please. Thank you, Susana. Good morning and welcome to the conference of the impact of standardization in European economic recovery, organized by the Portuguese Institute for Quality under the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. First of all, I would like to read the European Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Bergeton, and the Minister of the State of the Economy and Digital Transition, Pedro Cisa Vieira. I also want to thank the presence of all the guests and speakers that you are pleased to have with us and the participants who joined us on this day. Within the scope of Portuguese presidency, the Portuguese Institute for Quality, the national standardization body, considered that it would be important to bring to the stage the subject of European standardization with the intervention of all interested parties, European standardization organizations, European Commission, member states, business representatives, in particular small and medium-sized enterprise, representative of consumer and environmental and societal interests. There are, in fact, a set of issues that are still relevant to discuss. Namely, what advantage does standard continue to bring to the competitiveness of European and its company? What is the future of standardization and harmonized standard within the European internal market? How can standardization support the European industry strategy and help lay the groundwork for a modern and more sustainable Europe? We think that this event is therefore important and fundamental as a space to reflect together and to find common ways. In Portugal, you are aware of the competitive advantage and opportunity for the growth and level development that standardization provides to economic and social agents. The Portuguese Institute for Quality, together with this network of 54 sectorial standardization organizations, have been working to include a growing number of Portuguese companies and associations in the work of standardization. We have been also helping the integration of experts and researchers in the work of drafting European and internal standards. On the other hand, we have been constantly informing our government leaders and public bodies for the need to work together. But we are also, with our eyes on the future, committed to renewing our own national strategy for standardization in alignment with the sense and leg strategy. So, we want to make the standards generally used, to have the national organization and experts participating more actively in the standardization work, to digitize the standardization activity, ensuring its efficiency and quality. These are our goals. Finally, I wish everyone an excellent session that will certainly help to build bridge and fight common ways, considering that objectives that we want to accomplish are the same. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Antonio Mira dos Santos. We will start this conference with the welcome address from the Minister of State for the Economy and the Digital Transition, Mr. Pedro Cisa Vieira. I would like to greet Commissioner Thierry Le Breton and thank him for his participation in this conference. I would also like to greet, of course, all the participants in the conference, including the president of IPQ, the Portuguese National uh, Standardization Body. This is a very important conference in a very relevant moment for the economy and the building up of the single market. We have faced a very severe crisis caused by a major pandemic, 
which has shown and illustrated the difficulties inherent to the very large and very extended global value chains that we have built in the past few decades. Whilst they have uh, allowed for a very significant efficiency of the global economy, they have also illustrated how dependent we are in respect of a very uh, fragile moments when a disruption may occur in those value chains, whether by reason of a pandemic, but also a uh, terrorist attack, any disruption in the, uh, the transportation uh, systems, and all those put at risk the way our companies, the way our citizens are living uh, normally. So we are reviewing the uh, industrial strategy. We are identifying the need for redundancies and building up a more resilient uh, a, a European economy. A very significant topic of that is the ability to have uh, a single market which offers to our uh, companies, to our firms, the ability to work seamlessly across the European Union. Standardization is critical for this effect. We can only ensure that each of the companies in Europe, whether large or small, can enjoy the opportunities raised by a market of 450 million inhabitants if we are able to ensure that each product delivered and produced in any point of Europe or the world can freely access and reach all the consumers in this very wide market. This is the role of standardization. And I must say that behind the scenes, where no one very much is paying attention, the work that the European Union and the bodies for standardization have ensured in these last decades have been critical to the level of progress, prosperity, and growth of productivity that has been enjoyed by European citizens and companies alike. We must progress those uh, works. The work that SEN, Cinelec, Etsy have been developing uh, in these past few days uh, and, and will be uh, doing in this, uh, this conference is really uh, relevant. And the involvement of industry and inclusion according to due process are essential to ensure that standardization continues to be uh, of quality and relevant for the markets. And this balance is very important to ensure that we can make continued progress in the next future. The delivery of uh, regulations which support legislation must be accompanied by uh, the uh, references to the rules in the official journal. Today, we have an excellent opportunity to discuss the importance of standardization and its implementation by bringing together the regulatory bodies, the standardization bodies, and the relevant stakeholders within the industry. This will be a major contribution to the discussion of how the, an effective standardization in the EU is crucial to ensure the competitiveness of our industry. Thank you very much for your participation and have a very good work on the course of the day. I have just received information that the Commissioner Thierry Breton uh, will join us a little bit later. So let's proceed to the first panel. We will now start the first panel, which has the team standardization as a tool for the global competitiveness of the European Union. The first speaker is the Director of Industrial Transformation and Advanced Value Chains in DG Grow, Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMI, Mr. Gwenol Kozigu. Please, Ms. Mr. Kozigu, the floor is yours.
Yeah, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I would like to thank the Portuguese Presidency and the Portuguese Institute uh, for Quality for organizing this uh, important uh, conference. Um, what I would start with is first, I mean, the first panel is on global competitiveness, and what um, um, I think we have uh, restated with the, within the new the updated industrial strategy that the Commission adopted is the importance of uh, standardization in terms of ex exceeding uh, global market and ensuring our global leadership. Um, global convergence on the same international standards helps us reducing adaptation costs and strengthen the European value chains, and we're very conscious of that. Um, I would like first to make clear that we are all very much in support of uh, international standardization activities in line with WTO principles. Uh, basically, what I would say, uh, uh, working together uh, in order to develop the base on which we can actually trade globally. Um, I mentioned the update industrial strategy that the Commission adopted last week. Uh, in it, we made the clear statement uh, of where we see the European role in global standard setting. Uh, it's a role of a leader uh, with a, within a landscape, of course, that supports open global trade. Um, first, we should not forget where we come from. Uh, and we have to be fair, we've been very influential on the global scene in the past and global standardization. Uh, we, we, together with our uh, European and national standardization bodies, um, we have played a huge role and we still hold um, a lot of secretariats in international fora. And that has to be recognized. We are, we are not uh, coming from nowhere in the on the contrary. Um, of course, we have also to be conscious that new pay players are now challenging us and not always uh, with the intention of being reciprocal as far as access to their markets is concerned, and we have to be we have to look at the reality as it is. Um, so we this, we also have to recognize the fact that uh, international standardization is uh, increasingly challenged uh, to by trends to foster protectionism in some regions. Um, so being conscious of that, I would say that I've got three main messages. Um, the first one is offensive, the second is defensive, and the third one is about mechanics, uh, how we organize ourselves. First one, offensive. Uh, we need to identify where standardization activities at international level are, are of a key European interest, uh, and where European actors should or must uh, play a driving role in international standard setting. And we're going to work on that together with the member states and together with the European standardization organizations. The second axis on which we would like to work is what I would nickname the defensive one, is that we should not be taken by surprise and we should be alert on initiatives taken, taken by partners as far as international standardization is concerned. Uh, so we definitely need to increase our collective effort to know uh, what's going on, to inform each other where critical activities are being prepared or launched, uh, a sort of rapid alert system, alert system so that we actually can react and not be taken by surprise in the future. And to that purpose, we intend to create a network uh, that would actually alert European and national players if something is going wrong somewhere. And the third one, what I nickname mechanics, is uh, basically the fact that uh, we need to organize ourselves better. We need the European stakeholders landscape uh, to better work together. Um, we, and that's true both for identifying top priority international uh, sterilization uh, priorities and international sterilization efforts, uh, and to coordinate each other as far as implementation is concerned. So this implies, of course, European standardization organizations. I see that Elena Santiago Cid is with us, so I mean, she knows what I'm talking about because we've already got the opportunity to discuss that. Um, this also implies uh, national standardization bodies, 
but it also employs, of course, civil society stakeholders, member states. I mean, policy and standardization, and standardization uh, must play an in hand if we want if we want to basically play a bigger role. So I would say offensive, defensive, and what I call mechanics. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is the Director General of SEN, the European Committee for Standardization, and SINLEC, the European Electrotechnical Committee for Standardization, Ms. Elena Santiago Cid. Please, Ms. Elena Santiago Cid, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Obrigada. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is a real pleasure to be here today for this uh, Portuguese presidency event uh, under the virtual roof of one of the Senate and Senate national members, uh, IPQ. So all the best uh, for the event. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to plan together a robust and forward-looking strategy that can take all the benefits of European standardization to consolidate European leadership in strategic sectors and make open European autonomy a reality. I must say I very much like the input from Mr. Kosigu because he's very much connected with what I'm saying. So it means that we are already starting to coordinate. Sen and Senelec have got a tradition of giving primacy to international standards. Yet, we all need to increase our efforts to bring a coordinated European voice to the negotiating table in international fora. And then we will take full advantage of the European harmonization efforts. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that standards are crucial, not only to help industry to react swiftly to fast changes, but also to underpin the importance of regulatory cooperation. Standards have been a common language in Europe uh, and beyond, securing supply chain by supporting the urgently needed adaptation to alternative and fast production lines uh, without hampering essential requirements, uh, hence protecting professionals and citizens. Uh, Senate and the cooperation with ISO and IEC, our international partners, uh, framed by a common understanding with the European Commission and Member States and using at its best the new legislative framework has been instrumental in providing a timely response in those difficult times. In Europe, the new legislative framework is an excellent regulatory practice and it's unique in the world. It can bring the best solutions that the market is capable to deliver to achieve public interest objectives, safety, security, environmental protection. This is essential if it functions well. And what is very important for our discussions today is to understand the role of international standards within the European standardization system and the relationship that foster and that could foster an European open strategic autonomy. Europe is very well equipped with innovation-friendly legislation that can build upon market-driven standardization approach, promote global competitiveness, and at the same time, assist in achieving the green and digital policy objectives under the 14 ecosystems defined by the industrial strategy. But what do we need to do in order to see Europe ready to showcase leadership and global competitiveness? I would like to start giving my input and ideas uh, on this uh, strategy plank that uh, I have divided at the beginning. We need a common framework, we need coordinated positions, uh, and we need digitally ready standards and legislation. Common framework. Uh, working together with a common framework for terminology, safety levels, testing and measurement, uh, that apply in the same way for market operators, standardizers, and policy makers provide management confidence. And that will help to rely on innovative solutions since will provide and provides legal certainty and predictability. This implies on one hand to put European standardization effort to serve the international standardization developments through ISO and IEC, 
And on the other hand, to accept technical content, uh, if in line with legislation, of course, uh, resulting from the consensus building process at international level. Setting international standards with the relevant European policy and regulatory requirements from conception, from the very beginning, will certainly support global competitiveness and at the same time will strengthen the single market. As you know, SEN and SENELEC standards are adopted in 34 countries and national conflicting standards are withdrawn. But industry and societal stakeholders need to see return on investment. Standardization, to engage in a standardization sometimes it can be hard if they don't see the benefit for that. And we need them to be fully engaged in this strategic plan and to continue building on the public-private partnership that constitute the pillar of the European standardization model. Second input, coordinated positions. Technical standard setting, even if sometimes underrated, <laughs> have been highlighted in the European industrial strategy, and I'm very pleased with that. It is an important dimension of the EU strategy to save globalization. And this calls for a coordinated position, not only the European standardization actors, the European standards bodies, the national standards bodies, industry, societal, member states, and the EC need also to join us in this coordinated uh, position towards international standardization and SDOs, uh, where standardization is really at stake. It, it is not implicitly mentioned in the EC communication for the trade policy review from last February. But my understanding, and I fully encourage that, uh, is that trade policy, together with the renewed industrial strategy and the incoming standardization strategy, is an excellent opportunity to establish coordinated structural solutions, uh, involving and understanding the role of standardization to achieve the core trade and industry policy objectives, which are three, to my understanding, supporting the recovery and the fundamental transformation of the EU recovery, which is green and digital objectives, shaping global standards for a more sustainable and fairer globalization, and increasing the EU capacity to pursue its interests. The international landscape is very blurred. We have significant tensions in the WTO, some regions of the world have understood the role of technical standardization for global competition and are exploiting those opportunities. I would just like to mention China as an example, but there are other cases and each one deserves a business case. China has intensified its attempts to use standardization for the promotion of its international influence and use international standardization bodies like ISO and NIEC. In the last years, they have significantly increased the secretariats and chairmanships in both organizations in strategic areas, e-commerce, for instance, or smart grid user interfaces. These are initiatives that are currently being led by Chinese stakeholders. But also they are using One Belt, One Road initiative as an instrument to set standards outside the ISO and IEC, so that they can reshape the, the, the order of the technical standardization. Considering the Senate experience uh, and a very fluid communication with business actors, uh, our strategy 2030 elaborates on concentrating European standardization efforts in the development of ISO and IEC standards and engaging our international partners to commit to the same approach uh, to focus efforts in creating technical solutions that respond simultaneously to European policy objectives and provide wide market access. This will only succeed if all the drivers move in the same direction. European economic resilience heavily depends on its ability to be agile, to be ready to adapt the emerging technologies and innovation, and to listen to emerging societal needs. And that takes me to my third uh, input, uh, that is digitally ready standards and digitally ready legislation. The European Green and Digital Transitions call us to look forward and focus on innovation for promising areas. Uh, many of them are intertwined. So we can talk about uh, IoT, cybersecurity, 
artificial intelligence data, augmented reality, but also batteries, hydrogen, and raw materials. We understand this ambition very well, and we walk the talk by supporting the European Battery Alliance or the Circular Plastic Alliance with the standards, with the aim to develop technological and green leadership and export it to the world. We have some nice examples of Europe leading international standardization initiatives. For instance, in the battery sectors, uh, we have an initiative on electrochemical power sources. Uh, and also we have got uh, in the non-electrotechnical, in the plastic raw material, we have got the leadership uh, between in the coordination between the European and the international bodies to ensure that uh, we use and we align terminology, test methods, specifications, classifications. Uh, and that's extremely important to support the circular economy. At the same time, industry has made a shift from a sectorial industry to a very cross-sectorial industry. We need more horizontal standards. We, we need more cross-sectorial approaches. And standards offer a great opportunity to integrate diverse ecosystems, considering the impact that they have or may have on one another and exploiting resulting synergies. And in that case, Senen Senelec is also working to elaborate on this cross-sectorial approach with coordination committees, for instance, the Sector Forum for Energy Management uh, or our Industry Advisory Forum that is giving us input uh, on how we can address uh, those cross-sectorial challenges. Uh, we work on a daily basis on smart grids, smart meters, smart cities, uh, smart cities IoT, smart appliances, and intelligent transport system, uh, and it is very important to provide deliverables needed for Europe, but also from Europe, because we are also exporting those technologies outside Europe and benefit from that. We have great examples, for instance, for the Waste Electric and Electronic Equipment Directive, where Europe is a leader in making a standardization input and technology in the international market. And this is taking a lot of attention by China, Japan, India, which uh, it is, they are developing standards. We are developing standards at the international level that are based on European know-how and European work. We have a huge and very complex challenge in front of us, and we need to have a solid and well-functioning framework to succeed. Data management, data security, they all will have a very, very direct effect on developing initiatives to reach climate neutrality and accomplish the Green Deal. And the building blocks of future standardization deliverables will be generic data and content structuring tools. We absolutely need to develop those content-centric and data format for standards that are implemented at global level. We cannot do that only for Europe. We absolutely need that the document that we produce, the standards that we produce, the digital solutions that we produce are compatible, applicable, readable, and transferable for all users in the digital economy. And this is why Sen and Senelec have been also working hard on the digital transformation. And this is fully covered by our strategy 2030. But changes also need to happen on the readiness of legislation to become digital. Digital ready legislation in particular in the context of the new legislative framework for Sen and Senelec with a common framework of interfaces and, inter, um, in, and interoperable tools and reassurance uh, uh, for the citizens and consumers will be key on the next generation of the EU legislation. I don't want to leave without referring to the remaining challenge and to deliver the single market for services. I know this has been mentioned in the industrial strategy and it's really, it requires a lot of dialogue between all the different uh, players uh, in the market. Uh, we recognize the challenge and uh, we are happy to go ahead and ready to engage. Uh, just to conclude, because I think I'm talking too much, uh, consistency and coherence is vital in getting the full benefits of European standardization or, or just using digital terms to make our system fully interoperable so that policymakers, industry, societal stakeholders, researchers embrace the European standardization system systematically and strategically. Building on a strong foundations that we have, we are not only ready to look into the future, but it will make that happen 
to craft growth and resilience. The strategy 2030 will guide our path. And this is our strategy that was approved by Senate and Senate in November last year and has started in January 2021. So our standards would not be possible without industry engagement, without the involvement of societal stakeholders, authorities, innovators, to our strong network of national members. This sophisticated but yet effective consensus building platform will foster the evolution of our system and keep it a strong tool across the ambitions we all hold for Europe. Thank you for your time and looking forward to our exchange. Thank you very much. I have just received the information that the Commissioner Thierry Breton is already in our conference. So now I'm giving the floor to the Commissioner for Internal Market, Mr. Thierry Breton. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to speak with you today, dear Minister uh, Cesar Vera and ladies and gentlemen. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to, uh, to attend this conference uh, and, of course, even more on standardization, uh, which is, of course, uh, becoming, uh, let me tell you uh, this at the beginning, a very, very important, uh, let's say, battle uh, that uh, we will have uh, to cope with for our industry in the years to come. And of course, it's, this is starting uh, now, but I will come back in a few minutes uh, on this. Um, uh, and then, then I would like to thank uh, uh, very much uh, the Portuguese uh, Presidency and the Portuguese Institute also for quality to organize this very uh, important and timely discussion. A uh, few things to start. Um, um, uh, there is definitely, uh, you know, now uh, because of the pandemic and because of everything we cope with, uh, a, a, a growing awareness of. Uh, of uh, our need to be uh, more autonomous and also uh, as a continent, of course, uh, and of course, uh, being also more resilient uh, for all uh, our industry. And in this perspective, of course, uh, as you know, uh, we have organized uh, our uh, internal market in 14 uh, uh, very large ecosystems. And uh, we can see that uh, for each of these ecosystems, uh, of course, they don't have the same standardization uh, issues, but standardization is becoming very important. Of course, when we speak of standardization uh, for automotive industry, there is things uh, that come immediately in mind. But you may have also, and we will have standardization also in tourism, if we believe, if we think to the, let's say, a green pass or how to organize ourselves, to reopen and to start again to be able to socialize. And of course, uh, when uh, you speak in semiconductors, you have another uh, uh, subject of standardization and so on and so on. So uh, I would like now to enter immediately into the context of the uh, update of the Europe's industrial strategy, because again, this conference is, is really timely because we uh, presented uh, uh, just last week uh, uh, this update. Um, uh, and, and, and in fact, we have been tasked uh, by, by the European Council to do this. And I think it was a very good initiative because, of course, um, it came. It comes just one year after the industrial strategy that has been presented uh, uh, in March uh, last year, and of course, uh, uh, it was very important for us uh, to draw the lessons uh, of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, and also to put ourselves, uh, let's be honest, uh, in the perspective of uh, a recovery. How to organize uh, our continent uh, in this recovery? Uh, because yes, I could tell you as being also, uh, as you know, uh, um, task uh, uh, head of the EU task force for the vaccine, that because of the unbelievable effort that we have achieved and, and, and achievement, uh, uh, we will be able to vaccine uh, uh, as early as mid-July, 70% uh, of our population for the vaccines to do this. Uh, it's in the hands of the member states. And of course, um, uh, we can now uh, uh, start to think of uh, the after crisis, even if, even if we will have to live, of course, with uh, with the virus and to organize ourselves. But now we know how to, let's say, to do it and not to penalize uh, our uh, economy as, and also our, our, our social impact, as it has uh, uh, been the case uh, over the past uh, the past year. But this is why, again, it was important to review 
uh, our industry and strategy at the light of uh, what happened. And, um, and, um, and then uh, uh, um, uh, based on, uh, on, on uh, this uh, uh, analysis, uh, let me tell you a few things that came uh, uh, from uh, <coughs> our work. First, um, uh, Europe must be a standard maker, not a standard taker. And that's something extremely important. So what is the role of standards in this new industrial context? This is a, this is a question that we all now uh, be able to answer, or that is to raise, and then to answer. Uh, there is a saying, uh, who controls the standards gets the market. That's maybe something that we need to have in mind. Because standards will be uh, absolutely key to ensure future industrial leadership in areas. Of course, we have in mind, for example, 5G and 6G, but also dynamic data, but also cybersecurity, but also uh, batteries, hydrogen, quantum, uh, offshore wind, and so on and so on. And of course, this will require the full commitment of uh, the European standardization community. And Europe must be definitely a standard maker, not, uh, 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 let's say, a standard taker. We must regain global leadership in standardization. And it's true that, uh, uh, personally, I think that um, we, we, we let uh, uh, the, the situation and the place to others, including, of course, with our Chinese partners. And that's really something that we need uh, to tackle now. We must better anticipate and invest in those standardization activities and bodies. And that, uh, um, uh, because of course, this is absolutely strategic uh, for, uh, for our interest and for the one of our children. And of course, in particular, of, uh, in uh, key technologies. And this is, of course, in line uh, with what um, uh, uh, leaders expect from us. Um, at, uh, um, at the March, by the way, at the March, uh, EU, um, uh, uh, um, uh, European Council, uh, uh, um, uh, we have been uh, tasked also uh, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we will be able to, uh, let's say, uh, take back um, uh, global leadership in, uh, in, uh, in standardization. And of course, uh, I could not agree more, that, as you could understand, with this uh, statement. Um, uh, so, um, uh, if, if we want to dig in a little bit more, um, uh, one word on the role of the standardization uh, and standards in the twin transition. As you know, we have the twin transition, we call it the twin transition uh, for our continent with the Green Deal and, and the digital transition. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's important maybe to, to have a, a small uh, focus uh, on, uh, on this. Because standards, of course, um, uh, as, um, they have the potential to support the circular economy. Uh, they are being developed to make, uh, for example, uh, plastic recycling uh, happen or to deploy the charging infrastructure for electro electric cars. Uh, but standards are also uh, essential for the data economy, which is extremely, extremely, and become even more important in the years to come. And of course, uh, uh, for the digitization of uh, our SMEs. Let me give you one uh, striking example uh, in a traditional, let's say, uh, analog sector. Um, uh, the lifts sector. A new Internet uh, of Things uh, platforms will uh, connect nearly uh, uh, 40,000 lifts by 2022, making it possible uh, for lift providers, users, maintenance, and secondary services providers to efficiently share information. And the key uh, uh, to unleash the power of industrial IoT is definitely a standard for data and uh, formats and connectivity. So, uh, uh, um, um, to, um, uh, to, to conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, given the critical uh, role of standardization for our single market uh, economy and the uh, changing uh, global landscape, it is clear that the European standardization system, even if unique and successful, must adapt. And we need a European standardization system that promotes EU strategic interests and protects uh, our EU values. Um, uh, we need also a European standardization system that is uh, promoting uh, state-of-the-art standards. Also, uh, we should not forget our international partners, in particular the US. And as I underlined last week during the EU-US Future Forum, Cooperation uh, on standards is absolutely a key feature in our proposal for a new EU-US uh, agenda. And above all, 
uh, we need all European stakeholders, the Commission, uh, the EU member states, the industry and civil society organization, to be, of course, definitely uh, on board. And this is why uh, uh, the Commission decided last week, uh, industrial um, um, strategy update, to commit uh, to a standardization strategy by the third quarter uh, of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, very year. So uh, we had, of course, as I said, uh, no time to lose. And, um, and I would like uh, to, um, uh, to wish you, uh, um, of course, a, a very successful e event uh, and, and reiterate uh, the fact that uh, um, uh, you could count on, on, on us to be, to be active, but of course, all together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Hubert Schmigelmich, Acting Deputy Director from uh, General uh, DG Trade. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be here and to follow up on uh, Commissioner Breton's words because it's, as he said very well, it's a task or uh, working on standards which starts at home but has a competitiveness edge in the world. And when I was preparing for this presentation, I also talked to my chief economist and he told me that standardization actually adds to growth up to 1% in some of the European economies. There are some studies on France and Germany just by diffusing the knowledge and making it easier for companies uh, to work and produce there is actually a positive effect on growth. We should never forget that we do this actually in the end for our uh, prosperity and the well-being and the growth of our economies. And of course, as we have heard already, standards are crucial for international trade. The commissioner just said that who owns the standards owns the markets. And converging standards also help reduce costs for traders, improve the safety, enable interoperability uh, across manufacturers and countries. So, as we try to open the markets and support market-based competition, we also have to be aware if we don't do that, we actually create trade barriers, costly trade barriers and standards. That's one of the sayings that we have in the trade world. Standards are the new tariffs if you don't get it right. And this is why the interplay of standards and technical regulation is actually woven into the fabric of international trade rules. And we have created a system where we try to facilitate and encourage global convergence of standards towards international standards. Notably, and it was mentioned already, the WTO, the World Trade Organization Agreement on Technical Barriers to Trade, is our prime tool, our prime tool to uh, <clears throat> make all of us use international standards as the basis of technical regulations, with some exceptions, of, with some exceptions, of course, but that's the basic concept. Unfortunately, there is no definition between the WTO members of what an international standard is. The experts in the room will know these discussions, but it's crucial, it's crucial for our competitiveness that our standards are actually anchored in the international system uh, and that our partners also refer to the same international standardization organizations as us. And, and as was said already, the ability to influence the development of these regulations and standards of global significance is an important competitive advantage. So having a standard strategy and making sure that we actually do this becomes more and more important because we already heard as well for decades the EU was in the driving seat here. We were a leader on the front and championed work of the International Standard Settings Organization as ISO etc and, and the sector specific ones. But these successes are not a guarantee for success in the future and there is more competition coming up. But we are using, for example, our free trade agreements. There we give a lot of importance of ensuring that our partners on free trade agreements commit to shaping their domestic regulation on the basis of what we in the EU think are real international standards. So these agreements are part of what we do to promote standards as the IS, ISO, IEC, ITU, and the sectoral standards in pharma, automotive. We even have dedicated annexes in many free trade agreements which spell out exactly how you should go about so that pharmaceuticals or wine or whatever standards uh, are aligned and compatible with our free trade partners. But obviously the world is in constant flux. 
And our relative weight, we have to face that, is shrinking in the world, given the emergence of new regulatory powers, which are also trying to get some skin into the game. And the rapid technological development, which was mentioned, is also sometimes happening outside of the EU. So we have to do what we can to influence these emerging areas. I think we just heard about already some of the efforts that are underway. So we can continue to produce and promote the standards and stay ahead of the curve in the technological innovation and our new industry needs. And this is imperative, I think, and we have recognized it in our trade policy strategy, where we have a chapter about enhancing regulatory dialogues with like-minded partners and a closer dialogue of the EU and international standards organizations. I think this will be key to maintain our influence. So there is a need for all the people who are in this conference or in the room to work together and support each other more effectively uh, between the regulatory, the standardization and the trade community to make our objectives reality. And we are actually in the process now of identifying with the colleagues uh, in the organizations with DG Grow how we can be more effectively, uh, how we can be more effective in implementing this, how we can have stronger synergies between the international regulatory corporate cooperation activities that Gwen and others talked about of the Commission and the European standardization bodies. This is not entirely new, as you know, this we've done this for a while. We have a history of cooperation with the standardization organizations of in, in Europe and the partner countries. But we also realize that doing this and negotiating the agreement is maybe not enough. So we opened another, I think, discussion about, with, about the implementation of what we are doing. Uh, we have, as I said, good text and many agreements in the WTO, but we also have to, be, I think, be stronger uh, in order to actually make sure that all these norms, texts and agreements actually work in our interests. So we are actually paying special attention to implementation and hold our partners, I think, more accountable also when they diverge on standard setting activities. Now, the trade policy review also puts a lot of emphasis on the green and the digital transition. And we already heard quite a lot about digital services, standardization and these issues. So those are actually the standards of the future. And those will actually determine much of the competitiveness of Europe and European traders in the future. And these new and emerging areas have one advantage. You can work together with partners uh, sometimes more easily if you actually don't already have an existing standard system. We all remember how difficult it is, for example, and now I'm starting to talk about the United States, which is one of our key partners, how difficult it has been in the past to try to align or harmonize or, or have equivalence on some of the existing standards. Uh, and the key now that we have identified is not only to keep on working on this, it's good work, it needs to be done, but also to put a lot of focus on the uh, <coughs> on those areas which are emerging where the uh, the standardization activities have not already led to a certain result. The engagement with the United States on future standards, notably in the digital sphere, and maybe also having a better structure to work together on common approaches. So some of the key topics that we are now actually, as we speak, developing. You will have seen the work on artificial intelligence in the EU. There is a similar process led by the NIST, by the National Institute of Standardization and Technology in the US. And there are issues like cybersecurity, robotics, 3D printing, all of these, we have a real chance if we want to improve our footprint or increase our footprint to work closely with the United States. And this is the idea behind one of the proposals we have made to the Biden administration, which is a council or an institutional setting for tech and, tra for tech and trade. Trade and Tech Council, we call it, it might end up having another name, but at least we're trying to to have a systematic top-down view together with our colleagues in the US because their competitiveness is as, as much at stake as ours. I mean, we're both use, lo, lo, losing relatively weight in the standard setting scenery. And if we actually work together, I think it's very important that we, um, that we recognize the potential and actually make it alive of what the cooperation with the US could actually deliver. The United States is of course not the only priority. There are other players. Uh, we are trying to focus our trade policy not only on them. There is the neighborhood, there is Africa, Latin America, and of course Asia, which is very important. But on this, <clears throat> but on this particular point, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, we still have a chance to 
uh, work in particular with the United States. Now, let me just um, finish by saying one or two more words about um, what we're trying to do in the future about not only geographically, but also with the new industrial strategy, which is mentioned right now. Um, we are really trying to marry the internal work with our DG Grow colleagues and the external dimension of what we're doing as good as we can. This needs a constant dialogue uh, with you, with, with the, within the commission, but also with all of our stakeholders, uh, because that will only lead us to having the real the results that we want to do. And this is why I'd like to thank the organizers, the Portuguese Institute of Quality and the to grow and colleagues in Business Europe who are here and the ISO or the Senelec colleagues that we bring out that we ha that we actually have this chance to talk about these issues. I'm curious to listen on what else, what other thoughts come out of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I'm giving the floor to Mr. Luis Jorge Romero, Director General of ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. Please, Mr. Luis Jorge Romero. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm, uh, I welcome this initiative uh, from the Portuguese presidency and also from uh, IPQ to set up this conference. Um, I would like to, to show you, and I'll, I'll, let's try if uh, technology works, a few slides that we'll, uh, I will run through to uh, set a little bit the scene and, and look at uh, what we are trying to do as, as Etsy and, and how Etsy is, is trying to uh, work together with all the institutions and, uh, and and make it uh, make it happen. Um, Same uh, my slides are not coming yet. I'm just talking to the air now. Here they are. So indeed, I think I think several speakers today have already pointed at the relevance of standards for competitiveness in the European Union. Uh, I think that. Um, from Etsy, uh, we've we've talked here about uh, the importance of industry, the, the importance of all stakeholders. I would like to highlight here very much how much we believe that both the EC and member states are essential in the world functioning of standardization in Europe. Indeed, uh, the relevance of standardization, of, we believe, is even bound to accelerate as digital technologies increase their prevalence in our lives. Uh, we've seen that, we've heard that today. Um, and, and let me let me uh, talk a little bit about Etsy because we've we've been talking today about global, how how important it is to uh, have partnerships um, around uh, the world. Uh, in fact, Etsy being one of the three European standards organizations together with with San Sanlec, we are very much focused on ICT standards, and of course uh, that that drives the digital world. And it's interesting because our membership is composed of more than 900 uh, private and public sector members, which come from over 60 countries all over the world. So basically, when you look at that, say, yes, we are an European standards organization, but you can see that our footprint, both be because of what we bring in and both, and also because what we uh, put out in the, in the marketplace is global. So we believe that like that, Etsy is very, very well placed in the standardization ecosystem in the European Union, but also beyond. And I've been uh, talking about ICT because ICT is, is key in what we are as Etsy. And I think that uh, it's also important then to analyze what the role of ICT is for EU's competitiveness and therefore the impact of standards. ICT's influence and greatly impacts technology, society, economy, and policy. So uh, you may imagine that uh, all standards underpinning ICT are also following these trends. With regards to technology, of course, ICT, uh, we've, we've heard it, is, is in everybody's agenda today. Because of standards, or thanks to standards, high quality technology is widely available to all society. And this is something we tend to forget 
uh, we've heard about 5G, 6G. Well, those exist because this, this, there comes a history. And Etsy is very proud to be uh, funding uh, all these uh, events and all these uh, new technologies. We now have seen, uh, probably spurred by the crisis, how we are accelerating and we need to accelerate towards the digital transformation. And we also come to believe that all advancement in ICT should be for the benefit of all. This is what standards enable. From a socioeconomic perspective, we now see how ICT is embedded in society for everything. So everything, we can witness how uh, ICT is part of it. ICT is bringing an interesting dichotomy as well into people's behavior. And, and we see uh, the dichotomy of sharing versus owning, also the teamwork versus individualism. We need to learn and, and play with, with all these uh, assets. And then uh, what's also important, and, and we've heard it today uh, several times, that the number of actors impact, impacted and participating in ICT has increased exponentially. So this will bring to us that uh, there's a real need to increase ICT literacy or, or education and skills in all the population. Uh, with regards to the political uh, side of, of things, uh, we've heard today several times this, this balance between global and local uh how how we uh, strike this this right point between what needs to be global and how we can influence locally and i think in, in etsy we have uh, stricken the, this this right balance now and also we are getting more and more conscious of the environment and sustainability is one of the key dimensions where we need to to focus on and strive so uh, basically, we've heard also very ambitious plans of the EC for what's called digital Europe. And we believe that these ambitions cannot be completed without ICT and without standards. So be it for connectivity, post-quantum security, industrial data, cloud services, uh, electronic identity, you name it, standards will be critical to the success of the EU in walking the digital talk. Standards provide for economies of scale, and we've heard it again today. They level the playing field in very diverse industrial ecosystems and offer choice and security to users. So all these elements contribute to building trust. And trust is a key success factor to enable and establish an effective digital economy and to enable us remain the owners of our own future. Over the years, the EU have, has benefited from and has contributed to a very powerful standardization system. Uh, and I mentioned it, uh, all stakeholders have been involved in this system. The edification of the internal market and the EU global competitiveness in areas such as mobile communications or railways infrastructures, for instance, are very much based on a strong standardization machinery. So uh, definitely, we uh, are firm believers that the EU needs to have standardization machinery, which is functioning full speed in order to meet EU's policy objectives. It is important to remember that standardization is an activity led by voluntary contribution of those willing stakeholders. Now, there are many of those stakeholders. And there will be more and more. So both from public and private organizations, everybody is making huge investments to deliver standards to support the requirements as set by the EC. We need to keep a solid and stable model to incentivize the investment from the market players and to sustain the system. Again, standardization in Europe is supported on the concept of uh, public-private uh, public partnership. And this partnership can only work based on trust. So uh, this system, based on this trust, is promoting a very clear division of labor between, between legislators, standardizers, 
and implementers. And this le is leveraging the presumption of conformity where industry can rely on. And this in order to put products on the market. The system, again, has allowed the EU to produce in a very short time frame standards needed to support the, the internal market legislation, some of which made it big on global markets. And we have uh, good examples with all the generations of, of mobile communications. And, they are, and those are giving the EU the corresponding points of competitivity. We need to remain and maintain these principles. Of course, standards are not an exact science, and we are uh, bound by uh, external factors like economy, health, geopolitics, you name it. But uh, impact the system, those impact the system, and of course, there's no uh, silver bullet to make it perfect. But uh, we still believe that we are living in a strong system that has proven its value through the years. And if there's room for improvement, as, as there is always, we need to work out solutions to improve this system collaboratively. Now, uh, this model uh, will be at stake if we fail to follow this uh, cooperation uh, mood. So, um, Looking forward, we see that uh, standards have, have helped us better navigate throughout the current pandemic. Uh, we would not be speaking of uh, worldwide availability of mobile communications or the internet without standards. And we may be taking those as a given, but uh, I think we all realize that there's a strong long-term investment and effort to have made those possible. And a lot of, the, of that investment has been put through standards at the very beginning. So uh, even though we have been talking about migrating uh, to remote for many decades, it has only been this crisis that has forced all of us to act upon such migration. We have learned about our capacities and also about the many shortcomings that we are still facing, which we need to solve. And the question is, are we ready to solve those, those uh, those uh, challenges. I think we need to keep on uh, developing standards together. We need to keep on fostering cooperation at global level, as we are doing in Etsy. We are fostering this uh, uh, coordination and cooperation at global levels. And uh, standards are global. And we understand that even though they are global, they will be deployed locally. The complexity and varieties of the system does not allow that we go alone. We need global cooperation and partnership, and standards are a very important way to enable our economies to develop in a cooperative manner. So with this, I would like just to conclude by saying that Etsy is more than ready to take our share in this collective effort and to contribute to the improvement of the system, uh, because we believe that it's important that the EC and its member states grab this subject seriously and use your influence to help matters progress. There's a need to have a strong and functional standardization system if we want to be digitally sovereign. And with this, uh, I would like to close uh, my speech and hand over back to the uh, organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The last speaker of the first panel is Ms. Luisa Santos, the Deputy Director General of Business Europe, the Confederation of European Business. Please, Ms. Luisa Santos, the floor is yours. Muito obrigado, bom dia a todos. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting Business Europe here. I think it is important. We have heard a lot about the views from the public stakeholders. I think now it's also important to hear uh, the voice of companies, the voice of business, because in the end they are the ones driving innovation, but they are also the ones using the standard. So this is what I will try to convey today uh, in three uh, messages. So my first message is about the system of standardization the importance to keep the standards 
as a market driven implementation tool and not a mere extension of EU law. This is key if we want to ensure international competitiveness of European companies. Many of the previous speakers have highlighted that standardization has been a key and central element to deliver a prosperous single market. Standards provide benefits to the economy at large, and they're also important to facilitate trading goods, services, the interoperability of networks and systems, and the facilitation of innovation in the marketplace. The main objective of standardization has been, and should remain, to produce good quality and market relevant standards. This makes it a crucial tool for the competitors, the competitiveness of the European Union, but also of its companies in global markets. What should happen for standards to continue to deliver such benefits? It is important that the governance system functions well. Unfortunately, this has not been the case lately in the EU. The system has been effectively blocked following case law by the European Court of Justice, and we see now an increased role of the European Commission in the process and standards being set or being treated as an extension of EU law rather than a market driven implementation tool. And this is quite concerning for us because the system is becoming, is becoming slow and there is much less room for market relevance of the standard. This has also reduced significantly the incentives for companies to invest and to participate in harmonized standardization and it's impacting negatively our ability to influence international standardization forums. Many of you already indicated there is an increased presence of China. Of course, this is normal because China is uh, becoming a very important player in this area, but we also look, should look to ourselves and see if we are not also ourselves undermining our capacity to be present and to be influential in these forums. So for us, this is a key issue that needs to be overcome rapidly as it is leaving Europe and European companies in a position of weakness vis-a-vis uh, -vis international competition. On this first uh, message, I would like to finalize in a positive note. That is to say that we welcome, of course, uh, the revision of the EU industrial strategy, namely the recognition that the EU uh, needs to retain influence in global standard setting and that the standardization system in the EU should function in an agile and efficient way. This is key for us. So we look forward to contribute to the upcoming uh, standardization strategy that we are waiting later this year, as many of you said. And we also are ready to support the work of the newly established joint task force between the European Commission and European standardization organizations. Now, my second message is on the key role of standards for European competitiveness in third markets and for Europe to maintain technological leadership in a fast changing and uncertain international environment. We are all aware, and Rupert already alluded to it, that in modern trade, the main barriers are no longer the tariffs, but the fact that we have different regulations, different standards that can in practice limit access to the market, even if we have a free trade agreement in place. And this is particularly critical for SMEs, even more than for bigger companies. So we, we know that problems arise when an economy decides to take up its own standards, not follow international standards, and this creates uh, a problem also of competing standards for companies. It creates a problem of access to that market, but it also creates market fragmentation leading to uh, disturbances and issues in global supply chains. And this is a very, very important problem and very serious because it is something that we are seeing increasing 
and we are seeing increasing because we have uh, new players coming up in the market, as, as many of you pointed out, especially China. That is the new kid on the block. Uh, we used to have basically a competition between the US and the EU, but China is indeed very much driving, driving the seat now because of its very assertive policy, uh, because China is linking very much the standardization to its industrial strategy that is normally uh, known as the five-year plan, integrated in the five-year plan. And the fact that, of course, it is a strategy driven by the government, by the central government, with very clear objectives and supported many times by a very big role of state-owned enterprises. So this is giving China edge in many areas, and many of you, the previous speakers already mentioned the new areas, the digital areas, the new technology areas. This is where we see China taking the lead. These are the areas where we have less standards, where we have less regulations, and this is the area where China is taking advantage and trying to influence standard setting worldwide by also promoting its own, as many of you, and I think Elena mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative. Clearly, it's one of the tools China is also using to promote its standards. My third message and final is to highlight the importance of cooperation on standards with our key trading partners and the need to include also this important point in all EU trade agreements. Rupert already mentioned it. Um, our big cooperation has always been with the US. I mean, this has been very much at the heart of TTIP while we were negotiating the transatlantic trade and partnership agreement with US. We had some positive elements of that partnership. We had in the area of pharmaceuticals, for instance, but we think we can still do more in other areas. Uh, there's still a case for it in automotive, uh, but also in the new and digital area on chemicals, on traditional textiles uh, sectors, for instance. So this is something we need to promote. Um, and we're also very much looking forward to uh, the new possibilities of cooperation with the US through the Trade and Technology Council or whatever uh, body we decide to to create but it's clear that we should continue to work closely with us even if it's not easy because the us has its own uh, uh, interpretation of what the international standard is but it is important that indeed we try to find uh, cooperation and alignment if for if possible between regulations but also between standards because this is key is key for companies to ensure that we have less costs in accessing markets and that we also have more um, possibilities to increase our market share. I think here it's also important that um, we cooperate vis-a-vis -vis other, trade, other trading partners and that we ensure that we have reciprocity also in 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 this area of standardization it was already mentioned the case of China. We know very well that our companies, even the ones present in China, sometimes have and continue to have today problems in accessing standardization bodies in China and being capable of influencing uh, standardization settings. So it's also important that together with other partners, in particular the US, but also others, we work to try to address this. And our trade agreements are also key. If we want to promote uh, more cooperation, if we want to promote uh, a joint action with other trading partners, we should make this uh, a critical element of our trade agreements. Make the trade ad agreements also deliver continuously. A trade agreement is signed, but it's important that we continue to work on it. And clearly this area of standardization and regulatory cooperation is one of the areas that makes these agreements meaningful in the medium to long, to long term. Final point, and I conclude. Many of you already alluded to the Brussels effects. We have been leaders. We have been using the size of the market and the fact that we are an important market for many countries around the world to promote our standards and to have leadership in this area. But this is eroding because of other partners, because uh, the competition is, is very fierce. So we need to ensure that we keep 
at the center stage in this area. And as I said in the beginning, uh, it's important that on one end we get we get we get our house together and we become more agile and more efficient and we continue to have standards market driven base fundamentally. And uh, we also need to ensure uh, that internationally we leverage our weight and we work together with other partners to ensure that we keep also this possibility of influencing uh, standard international standardization bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. To start the second panel dedicated to the subject recovery with standardization opportunities for the single market, we will have Mr. Cosigo that participated in the previous panel. Please, Mr. Cosigo, the floor is yours. I believe Mr. Kozigo is experiencing some difficult problems. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Ah, OK. Thank I'm you very you. much. Okay. <laughs> we had some connection problems, but OK, it's fine now. OK, thank oh. you. Uh, thank you to give me the floor for a second time. Uh, um, I think, I mean, um, as far as um, the single market is concerned, I mean, as I mentioned during the first panel, uh, we are clear that standardization is essential. Uh, it's been critical uh, to develop single market. I would even go as far as to say we would not have a single market uh, without standardization. For those who are working on a daily basis on the single market, the, all the new legislative framework has been based on uh, the standardization work. Um, so it's. We have to recognize sometimes. Sometimes we have to recognize the successes which we uh, we together uh, have. So standardization is a success story. Um, and this being said, um, I think it's important as well that we'll honestly look at um, whether everything works perfectly or whether things could be improved and fixed. And uh, if we want to be perfectly honest, I think uh, that the system and the um, work uh, that is being undertaken uh, are not working as smoothly as one could hope and uh, what it should be. Um, it's of course uh, our, common, our joint responsibility, our common responsibility to make the system work. Um, and uh, I think that's the first message I would say. We're all in the same boat there and we have to row in the same direction. Uh, otherwise, it will not function. Um, as um, was, as was men I mentioned it, and as our, uh, Commissioner Breton mentioned it as well, uh, we are working on a standardization strategy that we are going to issue before the end of the year. Um, and um, we will, all, of course, uh, tackle the international dimension, which we addressed under the first panel, but we'll also, in, uh, we'll also address uh, more internal issues that we will dis be discussing here today during this panel. So uh, I would uh, like to mention to you basically directions um, in which we, we are thinking in view of this standardization strategy as far as the internal uh, dimension is concerned. Um, the first one is uh, how can we make the system work better to make it more efficient? Um, and for that, uh, we intend uh, to uh, to use a joint task force between the Commission and European Standardization Organizations that we are creating at the moment uh, to look at a great solutions. Uh, to adopt uh, standards, including fast manner, uh, fast manner and fast methods. The second one, the second uh, axis of thinking at the moment is a thing which will be important is we need to find a way to conciliate the need for speed and the need for uh, quality. 
Um, and for this, we, we always need to keep in mind what I would call the double dual role of standards. Um, standards are extremely important for industrial competitiveness, but they're also extremely important for society. Um, and this has to be taken into consideration. Standards might, must ensure safety, safety for consumers, safety for uh, work workers. They must also uh, ensure that uh, goods are compatible with uh, environmental saf safety. And uh, sometimes here the interest in, the, in our public-private partnership does not automatically square. So we have to look at that. The, the second part of this double dual role of standards, of course, uh, standards are extremely important for industrial competitiveness, but we should not forget either that harmonized standards are part of uh, European legislation, they're part of the EU law, as the European Court of Justice reminded us um, not so long ago, uh, because they give presumption, they allow uh, manufacturers to uh, benefit from the presumption of conformity, they apply these harmonized standards. And it, of course, implies rules and responsibilities. Uh, in this context, um, uh, one could think that uh, EU harmonized standards are developed for European industry and European, studies, uh, and European citizens, and one would uh, wonder whether they should not as well be defined by Europeans. So European standards for Europeans and by Europeans, um, that's also a, 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 a along which we are reflecting. And the third dimension, um, which is perhaps a bit a specific case, but very important, and we, I mentioned it already uh, as far as the international dimension is concerned, but it applies as well for the internal dimension, is that um, for strategic areas, strategic technologies, we might need a somewhat adapted approach, a somewhat different approach, um, first in order to be able to identify these areas, these technologies that are strategic, and uh, secondly, uh, to develop um, another method of developing standards in order to be faster. So what I would call a fast track method. Uh, this could apply to area like batteries, hydrogen, but you you heard our commissioner mention other 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 areas uh, in, in the field of quantum and so on. So uh, those are the areas where we're starting our reflection and of course this reflection will be conducted not only by commission officials in their uh, offices or, or at home, now that we are teleworking behind closed doors, but we'll discuss that, of course, with the European standardization organizations, national standardization organizations, member states, stakeholders. So that's uh, basically what I would like to, to say in, uh, in uh, drawing the picture of uh, our work in the months to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ms. Neviane Nikolaski, Chair of Etsy General Assembly. Please, Mr. Mrs. Neviane Nikolaski, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the Portuguese Presidency and the IPQ for organizing this important event and for inviting me to speak about the support which standardization can provide for the recovery of Europe and in particular how Etsy as one of the three European standardization organizations together with Sen and Senelec can support the European economic recovery and the twin transitions. The digital transformation of our economies driven by the rapid pace of technology development impacts all aspects of our life. The digital economy and the associated need for ICT standards are high on the political and policy agenda in every region of the world. Standardization plays a fundamental role in the digital transformation and the digitalization of our society where technologies such as broadband connectivity, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence and data analytics 
are enablers for greater industrial efficiency and sustainability. And as 2020's global pandemic starkly illustrated, standards are also vital to enabling the rapid rollout of technologies that can support the implementation of public health measures. Why standardization is so important and what ETSI as a European standardization organization is doing in support of the European economic recovery, twin transitions and resilience building. ETSI considers freedom of action, open access to information and technology, the respect for European values and an open, fair and competitive market as cornerstones for autonomy and technological sovereignty in a globalized and interconnected world. Standards prevent lock-in and closed systems. Standards covered, they convert best practice into usual practice. They facilitate interoperability and are at the core of open technology infrastructures which allow everyone to access the technology and take precaution against control by single players. On this basis, Europe can ensure that it has freedom of action as a leader of global trade, but at the same time can ensure that the digital infrastructures and platforms needed within Europe and for global connectivity don't show critical reliance on externals, don't have dependencies which cannot be controlled, and that via open standards, also European values are properly reflected and promoted, including be beyond Europe. As recently published in our Etsy strategy, I would like to highlight our mission once again which is to provide the platforms where interested parties come together and collaborate on the production of standards for ICT systems and services that are used globally. This is highlighting our Etsy commitment to be a reliable hub for all relevant stakeholders in the value chains of digital economy enabled by standards. The Etsy standardization platform is well positioned to be a catalyst for digital innovation and development within complex ecosystems, such as the 14 industrial ecosystems identified so far with the 2020 European Industrial Strategy. With member-driven technical bodies and special projects, focused industry specification groups open to non-members, annual plans for specialist and testing task forces and initiatives to support collaborations with research institutions, SMEs and societal representatives. Etsy has the requisite members, tools and resources to support to effectively leverage the European goals for recovery in the 14th identified ecosystems, as well as to support the ETSI, sorry, the European Commission industrial strategy ambitions for twin transitions, resilience building and technological sovereignty. The digital transformation of industries, services and our way of life was already pervasive in all sectors of activity but has been visibly accelerated in the months since the start of the pandemic crisis. Etsy provides the building blocks and the horizontal enabling technologies for the basic infrastructure that contributes to the success of the industrial ecosystems. The example of mobile communications and its massive innovation and value creation enabled by standards comes immediately to mind. But other examples where Etsy is a global leader can be found in domains such as the Internet of Things, smart manufacturing, intelligent transport systems, emergency communications, cybersecurity, 
distributed ledgers, blockchain, electronic signatures, multi-access edge computing, smart cards, fixed and mobile connectivity, maritime freight or railway communications, among others. Furthermore, Etsy and its members are actively engaging with all sectors as done in, in the recent past, providing solutions for ecosystems as smart cities, automotive, farming, health, or, or even aeronautics. It's important to know that Etsy has the tools and processes to be most responsive and effective when one or more of these 14 ecosystems present specific requirements that trigger needs for standardization. Etsy is able to accept new members quickly, allow them to participate, put together standardization groups, including Etsy members and non-members, in a very short time frame offer the needed support and training, choose the best way to organize meetings, facilitate the taking into account of policy and legal constraints, link the effort and benefit from existing standardization areas. The current industrial study group E4P on interoperability and privacy protection for COVID-19 contact tracing apps can be referenced as a prominent example in this respect. Etsy's work is driven by its members and is at the heart of the digital transition with a large and diverse community that includes administrations, consultancy, manufacturers, network operators, governmental bodies, service providers, universities and user associations. Being a bottom-up driven organization, our members' interests and support have driven Etsy forwards in promoting low latency 5G, especially important for use cases in smart factories, automotive and many other industries in creating the whole industry of self-optimizing, multi-access, multi-vendor, fiber optic and cellular digital communications, unifying the acquisition of digital data from nearly any kind of physical network through the open interfaces of 1M2M, addressing the virtualization of networks and services, automation of processes, through the use of artificial intelligence, distributed ledgers, and many more enabling concepts and technologies. Those are already huge benefits, but the further evolution and convergence of such technologies will be even more powerful. Data discovery and semantic interoperability of all that acquired data by means of appropriate interfaces and careful alignment of cross-domain ontologies. Collective massive amounts of data is only the beginning. Knowing its meaning, its provenance, its allowed usage and securing its integrity is essential to functional data marketplaces. For that re uh, reason, Etsy members have invested for over a decade in fundamental architectures and functionality of cybersecurity, now extending also to artificial intelligence, security and trustworthiness. In parallel to the digital transition, we at Etsy fully support the high prioritization of the Green Deal. Climate neutrality is a very relevant issue and we already address it directly or indirectly in many standards that support monitoring of the environment and enable lower CO2 release. Just to cite some examples, the contributions to the development of 5G ecosystem and on IoT systems and technologies are deeply spread throughout many Etsy groups, having a strong impact in increased on automation of industry and services, enabling a better monitoring and control of infrastructures, allowing for a better 
better energy efficiency and pollutants monitoring and leveraging clear enhancements of climate neutrality. Here I would like to go back to what Commissioner Breton said earlier today. Europe has to be a standard maker and not a standard taker. In this respect, being able to work at the global scale, scale leveraging worldwide partnerships such as 3G partnership projects and 1M2M, Etsy is proud of its European roots. Etsy is producing standards made in Europe for global use with strong leadership and high success. The wide acceptance of these standards contribute to the recognition of Europe as an advanced technological partner and opens opportunities for the European industry. Furthermore, at Etsy, we have taken innovation as one of our priorities, not only by leveraging in the potential of our large and diverse membership that includes the major players in the industry, SMEs and academia, but also through specific initiatives to strengthen the linkage between R&D communities and standardization. We promote specific events towards SMEs and smart cities to improve their awareness and their access to the benefits of standardization. We at Etsy, we are proud that the combination of our members' fees and hard work with added support from the European Commission allows all of our specifications and guidelines to be available freely and transparently globally. Etsy is committed to attracting, retaining and engaging all members in its work, large and small companies and research organizations, as well as other business, consumer, societal and environmental stakeholders. It promotes the participation of SMEs and startups in standard setting as a way to boost their competitiveness and access to markets. In conclusion, there is a good and broad alignment between our standard development activities and strategy with the priorities and objectives coming from the European Commission. This provides a strong basis for prioritizing actions, strengthening the public-private partnership and collaboration on the recovery of Europe, the twin transitions and future challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Mr. Stefano Calzolari. He is the SEN president-elect, but today he represents the SEN Senelec, European Standardization Committees. Please, Mr. Calzolari. Thank you. And uh, first of all, good morning to all of you. Uh, I have prepared some uh, slides and I ask kindly the organization to put in the screen the first, if possible. Thank you very much. But uh, I begin my speech in any case, waiting for the first slide. Thank you for your invitation to this important uh, event today, hosted by the Portuguese Presidency of the Council. It is my pleasure to join this important panel just after the industrial strategy has been issued and have the possibility to share the Sen and Senelec views to this important debate on the opportunities for the single market. I am proud to be here today to represent European standardization because with our unique model in the world, European standards will play a vital role in the future of Europe and it is up to us to decide how to make best use of our European standardization system, continuing to respect the principle and the objectives of the EU Regulation 1025. Standards represent in a very concrete way the EU's single market ambitions. They are its invisible engine, 
and depending on how successful we are in finding our way, they can be crucial for the urgently needed recovery and future resilience, dealing with both products and services and their related processes in the interest of the citizen lives. Furthermore, standards represent an excellent vehicle for the transfer of knowledge between the world of research innovation and the market, fostering modernization and development at all levels of society. The EU industrial strategy with the associated 14 industrial ecosystems sets out to boost Europe's resilience together with the implementation of a successful Green Deal and digital strategy. How we do this together fully depends on how smart we are in, in using the instruments at hand, and European standards play a crucial role. European standards are an effective tool for powering Europe's recovery and central to address the challenges across all the 14 ecosystems, identified from digital to health, to renewable energy and mobility, just to name a few. Our European standards have already played a crucial role in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, and Sen and Senelec will continue to provide ne the necessary solutions Europe needs to recover and boost our economy. Our shared goal is to strengthen the single market. And I am pleased to share with you that Sen and Senelec are committed to join forces with all of you to achieve this. The next slide, please. We are currently embarking on the implementation plan of our strategy 2030 which sets out our vision to build a safer, more sustainable and competitive Europe through international standardization. Being aware that the members of San Senelec are a selection of excellence elected at the national level to represent the state of the art of knowledge in many different fields and to determine what can actually be done in our future. We want to use our network to build consensus across industry and society in order to generate trust, stimulate market access and drive innovations for a better life. The next slide, please. Working together to achieve this will be vital for a strong and efficient single market. Our strategy 2030 sets out five goals. Uh, the next, please. UEFTA recognizes the strategic value of the European standardization system. Customers and stakeholders benefit from state of the art digital solutions. Increase the use and awareness of SEN and SENELEC deliverables. SEN and SENELEC system to be the preferred choice for standardization in Europe. Strengthen our leadership and ambition and at the international level. Uh, the next slide, please. As the European Commission embarks on the development of a European standard standardization strategy, we look forward to implement our goal one and work together with our sister organization ETSI and the European Commission to exploit the benefits of the new legislative framework principles as key conditions, not only for a solid and reliable European standard standardization system, but as a powerful catalyst for the recovery and resilience of the European economy. European legislation has relied on technical voluntary standards for the last 30 years for the efficient implementation and uptake of Europe's policy priorities. This approach, relying on the new legislative framework principles, 
has been an effective tool and should now be reinforced at a time when economic recovery is key to the survival of many European companies, especially the small and medium enterprises. Thanks to all stakeholders working together, we can develop standards that are fit to the latest technological and economic developments and provide solutions to the most pressing challenges. In our strategy 2030, we commit that our customers and stakeholders will benefit from state-of-the-art digital solutions, which will provide tangible results to the challenges identified in the revised industrial strategy. Our standards are the outcome of a collective work as they are developed through the consensus of our national members and heavily depend on the active contribution of industry and societal stakeholders. I am pleased to be on the same panel today with key contributors to our standardization work in SEN, Senelec and Etsy the so-called Annex 3 organizations. European standards represent the consensus of all European stakeholders, from large industry to small and medium enterprises, to consumers, societal stakeholders, as well as legislators. This, combined with our single standard models, ensure that European standards are effective at enabling intramarket trade and underpin the competitiveness of European industry. But standards also help create a world, a world we can trust. Standards contribute to high quality, safe, secure and su sustainable goods. Safety is a core area for European standardization from the toys our children play with, to the cookers we use in our kitchen, to the lift in our homes and offices, the 60% of our standards address safety issues, ensuring that the goods and services we purchase are safe. The example show how much standard can help people to live better. Once upon a time, the society was governed, was governed only by mandatory laws on the one hand and popular customs and traditions on the other. But in the last decades, and especially in the present time, standards represent a crucial intermediate reference for citizens, characterized by two fundamental interfaces. The first, in the relationship with the European authorities, requires to improve more and more the mechanism for issuing the so-called harmonized standard. The second, in the relationship with, in the, with industry, various stakeholders and social entities, requires to improve more and more the bottom-up process of creating new standards through a voluntary approach. Of course, we realize that we need to continuously evolve to ensure that our products and services meet the complex and rapidly changing needs of industry and of society at large. This is also core of our strategic goal three, where we commit to increase the use and awareness of SEN and Senelec deliverables. Our aim is to offer an open, accessible, seamless and responsive standardization system for all stakeholders. We therefore support and promote the role of the national standardization bodies and national committees in this regard as the most appropriate and effective channels for all stakeholders to get, to get involved in European standardization work. Our, we, our vision is that SEN and Senelec system will be the preferred choice for standardization in Europe, and, and that implies providing an open, transparent and inclusive standardization system, but also a system that is agile 
ready to adapt to emerging technologies and innovations and a system that listens to emerging societal needs. Let me conclude my statement with the last strategic goal, which aims to strengthen our leadership and ambition at the international level. From our side, we give primacy to ISO, the 40% of CN catalog identical or based on ISO deliverable, and IEC, the 78% of Senate catalog identical or based on the IEC deliverables. This unique nature and added value of the international first standardization principle, which we apply, ensures that Europe-wide adoption of international standards developed by ISO and IEC which is a strong advantage for the recovery and boost of our European economic sector in order to ensure Europe plays a leading role on the global scene. It is therefore important to focus that our job of producing good standards is not all important for the EU countries and for the single market, but influences a lot the technical solutions that other countries intend to adopt within other economic systems, making Europe an essential point of reference. I want to thank you for your time and let me assure you that SEN and Senelec are ready to work together with the European Commission, with ETSI, the Economic and Societal Organization present on the panel and all interested stakeholders to rebuild our economy and emerge a more resilient Europe after the challenging past year. Thank you very much with the hope to see you in person next time. Thank you very much. Now I'm giving the floor to Ms. Maitan Olabaria, Director of the Small Business Standards, the voice of European SME, SMI and in standardization. Please, Ms. Maiten Olabaria. Thank you and uh, very much for the invitation to IPQ and the Portuguese uh, Presidency. Um, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I think it is really important uh, to bring to the discussion the perspective of small and medium-sized uh, biz businesses. As we all know, um, SMEs represent the majority of all European companies and are key to ensuring economic growth, innovation and job creation in Europe. So I think when we are talking uh, about recovery, we cannot do without uh, SMEs and taking into account their, uh, their perspective. Uh, we know that uh, although many SMEs have shown their flexibility and have been able to adapt during the crisis, they have also been uh, the ones that have uh, suffered the most. Uh, they have been uh, more affected by the crisis than larger firms. So, as I said, um, there cannot be a recovery uh, and cannot happen without SMEs. And for this, I think um, it is important um, that we have a strong single market. This has also been um, mentioned already by several speakers. Um, also for SMEs, um, it is the single market is the go-to market. Uh, in 2018, for example, 80% of exporting SMEs were selling to uh, other uh, member states. So this is an important aspect that we need to remember. So in this respect, and it was already mentioned by uh, Mr. Kosigu, uh, I think it is fair to say also that we wouldn't have a single market uh, without European standards. So in this context of uh, recovery, standards also have a very important uh, role to play. Um, we know the new approach, new legislative framework has been central to achieving the single market, and it is actually thanks to it uh, and to harmonize standards that our companies can access new markets and also benefit from the reduced, for example, conformity assessment costs while improving safety uh, of their products. 
Nevertheless, and this has been already uh, mentioned as well uh, by Business Europe um, and also by the Commission, um, major issues have emerged uh, with the assessment of harmonized standards and their uh, referencing in the official journal due to a series of decisions of the European Court of Justice. Um, this situation has led uh, to uncertainties regarding the new legislative framework, harmonized standards and the European standardization system. Uh, as we know, and it was mentioned already, the new legislative framework is a major European asset and has proven to be an effective an effective tool for the single market. So in small business standards, uh, we are convinced that reinforcing uh, the single market is strongly linked to uh, keeping the new legislative framework principles. Especially for SMEs, the timely citation of uh, harmonized standards in the official journal is essential. Uh, this is essential to be able to keep their competitiveness and scale up. Um, SMEs need to have uh, up-to-date standards that allow them to benefit from the presumption of conformity with EU uh, legal requirements. And um, this is, I think, even more important in the context of recovery. Um, so for us, uh, the single market should be reinforced uh, to create growth. And for this, it is essential that we improve the European standardization system and that we solve the, the blocking factors uh, for citation of harmonized standards. The key question is how? How should we do this? I think. And um, in Europe, we already have Regulation 1025 2012 on European standardization. And uh, this regulation already provides a sound legal basis uh, for the European standardization system. And from our perspective, per perspective, sorry, there is no need to change the regulation. Well, what we need, and here I agree totally with Mr. Kosigu, we are all in, on the same boat. Uh, so what we need is to work all together, European Commission, European standardization uh, organizations, industry, and other stakeholders uh, within the system on uh, the implementation of the regulation to ensure there is a common understanding as well on the role of each of the actors in the system and specify clear objectives for the timely delivery and citation of standards. So to this respect, we also welcome very much um, the joint task force uh, between the Commission and the European standardization organizations. And uh, of course, as a small uh, business standards, we, are, we would also be happy to contribute to the discussions uh, if needed. Timely delivery of standards is also fundamental if Europe is to reach the objectives uh, it has set itself uh, in relation to the green and digital transitions, which are also closely related uh, to EU's recovery. Uh, European standards, for example, are going to be essential uh, to support the uptake of new uh, digital technologies and more sustainable products to achieve to achieve uh, appropriate security and interoperability, um, to foster the data economy, as it was mentioned earlier, and for example, also to foster um, the market for secondary raw materials and reduced products, which are uh, a key aspect as well of uh, the green transition. But uh, something we believe is really important to highlight is that uh, to achieve these standards are important, but it is also essential that the standards are written with SMEs in mind because it won't be possible to have a successful recovery and a successful twin transition without SMEs. This brings me to um, the issue of inclusiveness. And uh, before Mr. Kosigu mentioned um, the need to conciliate um, a speed uh, with quality when we are talking about standards. And I would add a third element. I think there is a need to conciliate speed, quality and inclusiveness because making sure all relevant stakeholders are around the table when developing standards is key. This is key also for their uptake and it is also an important principle of the European standardization regulation that we should not forget. It is important SMEs are involved in standardization because otherwise we have the risk of developing standards that only 
cater to the needs of big companies. And um, although there have been considerable uh, achievements and advances regarding inclusiveness, uh, we also think there is still room for improvement and the participation um, of SMEs in standardization still rema remains a challenge in, in several aspects. Um, moreover, I think it is important to remember here um, that, and I'm uh, actually making a link also with the, with the first panel, there is an increasing number of standards being developed at the international level either in parallel with the European uh, standards organizations and with the international ones, or they are taken over afterwards by the European standards organizations. And this is important. Uh, there is also as well, as it was said before, uh, the aspect of not only being um, standard takers, but also standard makers. But uh, this is also important because there are in, uh, there are sectors that are international by nature and having common European international standards uh, can actually help them to access new markets and support the global competitiveness of European uh, businesses. Nevertheless, regarding inclusiveness, I would also, uh, we also need to be aware that this also brings an additional challenge uh, also for SMEs, since they have more difficulties to be present at the table in international meetings. For us, it is therefore essential to reflect on how inclusiveness can be better achieved by ensuring solid support uh, to the further participation of SMEs in the standardization process, both at European and international level. And we need to ensure uh, these um, by making national, European and especially uh, international standards bodies speed up their pace to facilitate the effective participation uh, of SMEs and also other stakeholders in standardization. Um, to this respect, uh, there was also before some uh, mentioning of the need to be aware of key developments. Uh, we totally agree with that. And I think a prerequisite requisite, um, also to be uh, more involved in standardization from the point of view of SMEs is also to fa facilitate the monitoring of standardization developments so that SMEs, which have less resources, can be aware of what are the different uh, standards being developed. And SMEs and SME organizations can, in this way, be involved in an early stage in the development of standards so that they have the opportunity as well to shape the content of these standards to meet their needs. Financial support for the involvement of SMEs in standardization, uh, for example, through SME organizations, should also be available and is uh, also a key issue uh, from the perspective of SMEs because as we know SMEs do not always have the same resources than bigger companies to get involved and uh, this is also uh, very important. Finally there is a last point I would like to make uh, which I think is also essential. Um, standards can only support the single market and recovery if they are implemented. I have the sensation a lot of times when we are talking about the standardization, we are very much focusing on the development of standards, but it is important we don't only limit ourselves to the development of standards. We need to put a stronger focus on facilitating their uptake. This is also an important um, aspect that we are um, actually um, working on within SBS, raising awareness about standards and helping their uptake among SMEs. SMEs normally have less resources to get guidance or, or consultants to help them implement a standard. Uh, so we really think the European Standards Organ Organization should dedicate more resources to the development of practical guides to, uh, guides to facilitate uh, their uptake. Commissioner Breton mentioned, for example, um, before the case of uh, lifts. 
I think this is uh, as well an interesting case because uh, in SBS, for example, uh, through uh, some of our experts, we have been involved as well in work in Etsy in order to develop um, standards that can help the lift sector to implement IoT in the sector so they can benefit uh, from, uh, from this kind of, uh, of technologies. So I think this is an important aspect we should not uh, forget. We should also have a focus on implementing and helping um, businesses to uh, implement the standards that can help them to uh, profit from these new technologies and help them in the digital and um, green transition. Um, let me conclude by saying that um, as a summary, that a well-functioning European standardization system is essential uh, for a prompt recovery. But as I said, um, we need to ensure that uh, standards are SME compatible, that they duly consider the needs of smaller businesses and help them to profit from the opportunities, as I said, and advantages of, uh, of the green and uh, digital transition. Otherwise, we have, uh, as I said, the danger of uh, creating barriers or additional costs for SMEs rather than helping them in this, in this uh, transition and in uh, recovery. It was already mentioned uh, that uh, the European Commission uh, published last week the, um, the updated uh, industrial strategy where the publication of the standardization strategy is foreseen for the third quarter of this year. Small Business Standards is looking forward to cooperating with uh, the Commission and all other uh, stakeholders in the development of the strategy that uh, fully considers uh, some of the points that uh, I, met, uh, I made uh, here today. And I think with this, I would like to, um, to finish uh, and thank you once more for your attention and the opportunity of putting forward uh, our thoughts. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Stephen Russell, the Secretary General of ENEC, the European Consumer Voice in Standardization. Please, Mr. Stephen Russell. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, of course, I join with my colleagues in thanking IPQ for hosting this event under the Portuguese presidency. I am also honored to have been invited to present the consumer view on behalf of ANIC. But first, um, a few words about ANIC in case you don't know us. Uh, ANIC is the European Consumer Voice and Standardization, as Susanna said. Our membership mirrors the 34 countries of SEN and Senelec, with national consumer organizations in each country nominating a national member to our General Assembly. We bring together almost 200 consumer experts from our member countries to set consensual positions in the collective consumer interest and promote them not only at European level in SEN, SENELEC and ETSI, but also at international level in ISO and IAC and in other fora such as UNECE. With a very few exceptions, all of our consumer experts are volunteers, contributing a value of over 550,000 euros to our work each year. Beyond our work in standardization, we advocate the consumer interest through a continuum of consumer protection and welfare, which comprises policy and legislation, with BEOC, uh, the mainstream European Consumer Association, through conformity assessment and onto accreditation, market surveillance and enforcement. So that's what we are, but why do we do it? Well, consumer expertise, or rather in the products and services being standardized rather than standardization itself, is fragmented or absent at national level in most countries. If we did not offer a collective voice on behalf of European consumers, then there would be a deficit in the public-private partnership of European standardization that has, I think we all agree, has supported the European single market for goods so well now for over 35 years. Now, um, as we have heard, the European Commission last week published 
an update to its new industrial strategy of 2020, to reflect on the impact of the pandemic, to learn the lessons of the crisis, to strengthen European economic resilience, and to accelerate the green and digital transitions. Now, there is much to welcome in the strategy, and we certainly look forward to it as a precursor to the standardization strategy later in the year. That said, there are two sides to a conversation, and for us, the industrial strategy speaks with only one clear voice. We do not hear the voice of the consumer sufficiently. So I think a simple message I'd like to give. Um, the demand for the products and services of European business can and is being built already in the recovery, but it will not be optimized without confident and empowered European consumers. Consumer spending made up 54% of EU GDP before the pandemic. So for reasons of economic and societal benefit, the consumer voice must be heard and consumers must be at the center of the digital decade and the Green Deal. Again, the European standardization system is unique in the world. It is the only system of standards development where participation of all stakeholders in the development of standards is facilitated by law, Regulation 1025 of 2012. And this is also to the benefit of business. Inclusiveness means a product or service that complies with the European standard should have a competitive edge on the global stage by also reflecting societal and social needs that may be missing from other standards. But another way, knowingly or unknowingly, business tends to focus on meeting the needs of the average consumer, where the costs of delivering a product or service are lowest and profits highest. This leaves vulnerable consumers, young children, older people, and persons with disabilities at special risk of detriment. The best example of this remains the exclusion clause in the first generation of Senelec standards for domestic electrical appliances, covering everything from a toothbrush to an oven. Now, vulnerable consumers were excluded from the safety requirements of these first generation standards unless under supervision. ANIC championed the deletion of the clause and co-led the technical work to revise the standards and strengthen their requirements. As a result, literally millions of appliances sold annually that now comply with the EN 6335 Part 2 standards are safer and more accessible for consumers of all ages and abilities. Now, despite all consumers being at risk of vulnerability in the digital age, especially noting the lack of security of connected products, and I'm sure we've all read those stories in the media, it is still children, older people, and persons with disabilities who have the highest chance of suffering detriment. It is why we have paid particular attention recently to initiatives aimed at promoting design for all in stands for products and services, such as EN 301549 in Etsy, and in issues such as the accessibility of public websites and apps, and the accessibility of the built environment. For example, the new EN 17210 standard in SEN. But an important fact, standards cannot do it alone. Standards cannot take precedence over formal legislation, even if they sometimes have legal effect, as we heard from Mr. Kosigu. The European legal framework has to be updated and completed, and there should be strength and foresight and partnership between the regulator and standardizer. For instance, a critical mass of consumers will maximize the benefits of the digital decade only when the products they buy are both safe and secure. Some connected products, including I'm afraid smart watches for children, are still easily hacked. Similarly, 
in the move to smart cities, smart citizens, and smart transport, there are still concerns about data security. We need European product laws revised to require connected products to be safe and secure, not only when the product is made available, but when modified through software updates and throughout the expected lifetime of the product. Standards can then embed the privacy by design of the product underpinning the legislation. Moreover, we believe the regulator should seek independent third party certification for products that are high risk or will be used principally by vulnerable consumers. Similarly, on behalf of the 190 million European consumers aged 50 or over, and I have to declare a vested interest, and the 80 million European persons with disabilities, products and services must be required to be accessible for all. Now, turning to services, we still lack a pan-European legislative framework for the safety of services, even though services make up 75% of EU GDP. This means European standards on services cannot be implemented equally across the member states if often conflicting national legislation is in place. And this affects everything from the safety of tourist accommodation to cross-border services and leads to consumer detriment. We believe services need to be added in the industrial strategy as the 15th industrial ecosystem. Nevertheless, new standardization work on customer services, complaints handling, and user satisfaction could help increase consumer trust and have a positive impact on the recovery of the services sector. Last but not least, we need legislation to set an expectation that products are made to be as durable as reasonably possible and be more repairable when they do fail. Now, we don't think we need forests of red tape to meet these and similar aspirations. It would frustrate the ambitions of the recovery. But we do need legislation to set a level, a level playing field in Europe that protects European business from unfair competition, allows the confidence of consumers to be secured, and most importantly, allows consumer demand to be unleashed. We can then do our jobs as stakeholders to develop the supporting standards. Finally, uh, some words about the legal environment in which European standardization operates. Um, I think we've all heard of the James Elliott and Amstar rulings of the European Court of Justice. Uh, Business Europe has already made mention of them, as has SBS. Taken together, these rulings mean that at least some European standards have legal effect. And as all European standards are implemented as identical national standards in 34 countries, including all member states, this status means member states should be ensuring, ensuring their national standards bodies involve all interested parties. Or if not that, that member states are at least backing the EU institutions to support and strengthen the organizations that provide a collective European voice, such as ANEC, ECOS, ETUC, and SBS. This needs to be particularly remembered when more and more European standards are being drafted or revised in ISO IEC, as SBS has said, even though Europe is now looking to set the standards agenda. Building on what Business Europe and SBS also said, we need to accept that the Commission has a right of oversight, but what we must not risk are continued delays in the referencing of standards that cause industry to no longer invest in European standardization, to walk away from European standardization, and instead to go directly to notified bodies where they can pay for type approval in order to achieve market access. If that happened, we as consumers would have no influence over the specifications the notified bodies choose to use, 
and SMEs will be driven from the market by the costs involved, so reducing consumer choice and competition. It's a fine line, but for the success of Europe, we need to ensure a win-win. Thank you, everyone, and thank you again to IPQ. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speech is from Mr. Justin Wilkes, Executive Director of ECOS, Env Environmental Coalition and on Standards. Mr. Justin Wilkes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. Uh, I'd like to uh, present to you uh, ECOS's view uh, on uh, the issues that are being discussed today uh, and to obviously start by saying thank you very much uh, to the Portuguese Presidency and IPQ for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing ECOS. Uh, I'll then talk about uh, the green and just recovery uh, and then standards for the recovery in the EU Green Deal uh, and how standards are then used to support the single market uh, before looking uh, at the more global level. Firstly, I'd like to introduce ECOS. So ECOS is the new ECOS. Uh, we have a new name and we have a new branding. Uh, however, our acronym remains ECOS, uh, but we are the Environmental Coalition on Standards. And there's a few things we wanted to do with that uh, rebranding. Uh, we wanted to show that ECOS is an environmental uh, NGO, uh, but uh, specifically an international environmental NGO. Uh, and that it provides technical expertise uh, for the standardization system and is a network of members and experts. In terms of uh, the green and just recovery, uh, I think it's very, very important uh, to be aware that obviously the shape uh, of the recovery uh, will shape our economy uh, for a generation. Uh, will that be a clean and circular economy uh, or will that be a different type of economy? The Recovery provides an ideal opportunity to address environmental urgency emergencies such as climate change uh, and ambitious policies and robust standards should be at the heart of the economic stimulus packages uh, that are being promoted across Europe uh, and the rest of the world. Standardization can and should uh, simultaneously support the recovery uh, and the twin transition uh, to green uh, and digital. Uh, I think standards uh, as a tool uh, are, are key in this element. In terms of how standards uh, support the recovery and the European Green Deal, uh, I think it's a substantial support uh, and an overwhelmingly positive support. Uh, standards can be used for optimising product design, greening of high impact sectors uh, such as low carbon cement, uh, such as hyper efficient uh, data storage products uh, or hyper efficient cooling. Uh, standards can also be used to rethinking uh, production processes, packaging, plastics, uh, and I think here will be key, uh, will be turning uh, reuse and refill systems into the norm uh, rather than the exception. Uh, and I think the standardization uh, system that develops uh, the uh, takes first mover advantage in universal packaging sizes for reuse and refill uh, will be uh, the standard uh, maker uh, and not the standard taker. Standards are also going to be cru crucial uh, for uh, greening our textile sector, construction waste, uh, and also for carbon neutrality and sustainable finance. Uh, how do we measure sustainability? Uh, how do we measure uh, carbon neutrality? In terms of using standards to support the single market, uh, standards uh, are a fundamental element uh, to support uh, and implement EU policy. Standards support regulation, they should not uh, replace regulation, uh, and standards uh, should be seen uh, as enablers, not as barriers. Where they are identified as barriers, in the small number of cases that they are identified as barriers, uh, in terms of the transition to a green economy, uh, whether that's uh, preventing low carbon cement alternatives from reaching market, whether that's preventing the deployment of natural refrigerants, um, then I think it's absolutely vital that any standardization strategy uh, looks at a concerted effort uh, as to how those standards uh, can be addressed. Uh, and I think key uh, to that process will be the participation of environmental stakeholders. Uh, and I hope the standardization strategy will acknowledge that uh, important reality. 
In terms of now looking at the global level, uh, obviously the single market is a market uh, within uh, a global market. Uh, will the economic and environmental transition be characterized by cooperation, competition, or coexistence? Uh, and I think that's an absolutely key issue. Uh, so for example, uh, will, uh, will, will, will the resources that underpin the environmental economy, uh, will they be subject to cooperation, competition, or coexistence? I'm thinking they're cobalt, I'm thinking gallium, I'm thinking it, indium, lithium, just to name uh, a few. Uh, and what about the products uh, and technologies that will underpin the environmental economy, whether that's batteries, whether that's hyper-efficient cooling technologies or hyper-efficient data storage technologies, uh, how will they develop, be, be developed uh, at the global level through cooperation, competition uh, or coexistence? Uh, and I think the third element there is the business models uh, that will underpin the environmental economy moving forward. Uh, one example there that I've already given is reuse and refill systems uh, as the norm rather than the exception. Obviously, uh, it's not going to be either cooperation, competition or co co coexistence. Uh, the global uh, fight uh, for uh, global dominance uh, will, of course, be a combination of the above. Uh, the US, for example, re-entering uh, the Paris uh, Climate Agreement will, of course, uh, result uh, in increased uh, cooperation, but also increased competition. In terms of uh, using uh, standards uh, to support EU policy, there is a growing use of international standards to support EU policy. Uh, ECOS uh, has no issue with that uh, on a point uh, of principle. Uh, the EU industrial strategy, I think, is key uh, in terms of global leadership in technologies, goes hand in hand with leadership in standard setting. Uh, and I think the other key element to bear in mind is the sustainable development goals will increasingly set the, glo the global agenda in the 2030 timeframe. And that will, of course, uh, include environmental issues. Looking globally, Inclusiveness uh, must become an overarching principle in international standardization. Uh, and I think there the uh, parties to the Aarhus Convention, such as the European Union, uh, need to take their legal obligations seriously there in terms of promoting uh, the access of environmental stakeholders to international discussions. International environmental agreements, uh, I think, is as a driver for standardization. Uh, we have the Paris Accord, uh, we have the Montreal Protocol, uh, we have the Basel, Rotterdam, St Stockholm conventions. All of those international agreements are using standards uh, in one way, shape or form. Uh, and I think the increasing number of those international environmental agreements does need to be paid more attention to by the standardization system in a strategic manner. Uh, and I think the, uh, the creation of a uh, international treaty uh, on plastics waste and plastics pollution, I think will be a very interesting example for the standardization community to engage in in a strategic proactive way. Uh, and I think my last point uh, to make uh, during this presentation is obviously trade policy. Uh, and we need to reimagine trade policy to make sustainability the norm uh, and link that, of course, with the EU Sustainable Products Initiative uh, to make sure that uh, EU trade policy is compatible with all other EU uh, policies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The last speech of the second panel will be made by Isabel Schoman, the Confed Confederal Secretary in Charge of Standardization at ETUC, European Trade Union Confederation. Please, Ms. Isabel Schoman. Well, I believe we are experiencing some technical uh, issues, so let's move forward um, and let, let's go to another part of our conference. We are almost at the end of this conference, so let's hear the for the um, the closing remarks. Sorry, by sorry, I, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I was just given I was just given the floor by uh, the organizer of this conference. I couldn't open the microphone before, so that's okay. the reasons why. Thank you so, very much. 
yeah so um thank you thank you for your invitations and i think i can't uh, give the speech i prepared yeah Is yes it okay please. yeah yes, thank you please. very much uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting the european trading confederations at the table um, discussing the issue of the uh, future of standardizations. Uh, good morning to, to all of you. Uh, and I would like to address uh, three points uh, in these uh, presentations. The first one is, of course, uh, and that has been also mentioned uh, during this morning uh, sessions, uh, that standardization should deliver for the people and for the planet, and not just for industry and for competitiveness. The second point would be also that uh, we need to address the relationship between the European standardization and the international standard setting dimension. And I will also find, uh, give some final words on the issue of uh, harmonized standards. So um, to start with uh, indeed the first point, um, of course, uh, traditionally standards have been written for industry and by industry for competitiveness purposes. Um, but um, I think we need to acknowledge that uh, standardization has to evolve and has to adapt to the need and the demands of society and not just for business. We've heard from DG Trade that standards contribute to the prosperity and the well-being of the economy. And I think we need to add then that, that standardization should contribute to the prosperity and the well-being of the people of Europe as it has also been mentioned by DG Grow. This is why the European, this is what the European can and can do well. And this is the reason why the European should be a standard setter and not only standard taker, as Commissioner Breton, Breton rightly said in his introduction. I would add that this is where the European Union makes the difference, where trade unions and civil society have a role to play. And this governance structure is a game changer that should require more attention and more involvement. Standardization should not only guarantee that product placed on the market are safe and for consumer, they should also be safe for uh, workers that operate the machines and that deliver the services. Over the last decade, there is a growing development uh, of uh, not only industry-based standards, but also of service-based standards. We also witness a move from, from technical standards to standards addressing human and workers' rights. Over the last year, we have also seen a constant switch towards the international standardization. Um, this is one aspect that uh, we have also witnessed uh, on um, standards looking at social responsibility, management systems, services and digitalizations. These are standards area for which workers' rights are more prominently affected. However, private standards are not meant and should not in any case replace social law, industry relations and social dialogue structures. Standards support the single market, and they should first and foremost respect EU treaties and secondary laws, including the rules under the EU social policy chapter. And I would like to recall here the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union in its Article 51, sees that um, it should be the compass for any EU legislations and initiatives and should support the social market economy that includes the European social dialogue. For that, the Charter should um, be addressed, uh, the Charter, the provision of this Charter are addressed to the institutions, body, offices and agency of the European Union, and those shall therefore respect the rights, observe the principles and promote the applications of the treaty. We see that standardization can deliver for safer and healthier workplace and working conditions, and the trade movement gets involved to influence the content of those standards. For the ETUC, it is important that these standards achieve the highest quality of working conditions that are in full compliance with EU law and that respect industrial relations systems, 
of the member states and collective agreements signed by the trade unions and employers or employers associations. Having European standard can help achieving upwards convergence, meaning that workers in countries with less safety requirement would benefit from better working conditions. The ETUC notes that standards will increasingly be used to underpin policy goals in the framework of the digital and the green transition that are operating in Europe. The ETUC is, for example, very active when it comes to artificial intelligence, where harmonized standards will underpin the new legislative act. However, um, AI cannot be reduced to a product as any other product, in particular because of its immateriality. It is also clear that ethical rules on artificial intelligence do not belong in standardizations, nor does the right to protect data and to respect privacy. We should be clear here that the presumption of conformity for the introduction of AI and intrusive digital technology at the workplace is not appropriate. Finally, where standardization projects are not compatible with EU values and principles, like the one related to compensation, for example, the ETUC will clearly oppose them, and the EU should do the same. It is key that standardization do not lead to social dumping. Likewise, standardization on green finance or other areas as developed by ECOS, and thanks Justin for that, that those standardization on green finance and environmental standards do not lead to greenwashing. This is the reasons why we must remain very vigilant. I mean, we, the Annex 3 organization, of course, but the European Commission in any case, and Sense and Elec also. And this is the reasons why more attention should be given to the Annex 3 organization. And on this part, uh, I would like to remind that uh, we are not annexed, we are key uh, players and key actors uh, in standardizations uh, and the new phases of standardization should lead to the recognitions of uh, these organizations uh, as such and not as uh, side organizations. When it comes to my second point, which is the relationship between European standardization and international, international standard setting, it is clear that um, as uh, Commissioner Breton, and I would like to um, restate again his, his phrase, EU, the EU should be standard setter and not a standard staker or follower. And um, this is where we see uh, one of the weaknesses uh, of the European that should be uh, indeed uh, taken into consideration. Over the last years, we have also seen a constant swift towards the international standard setting uh, organizations. We see more and more standards which touch upon workers' rights, workers' issues, uh, like the sharing economy, human resources management, active aging, uh, and issues that are no longer uh, taken at the level of the European Union when it comes to standardization. The uh, ISO organizations uh, has a range of weaknesses with the whole respect uh, due to this uh, ISO, I think we have to recognize those weaknesses and we should uh, address them properly. For example, the ISO does not force special arrangement for so uh, societal stakeholders. Uh, and of course, this is one of the specificity of the European Union that should be a real asset on which we should build. The ISO has the concept of global relevance and um, in that respect, uh, we would clearly welcome uh, an ISO system that could facilitate uh, the access of stakeholders, and in particular of trade union. For example, currently we need a preliminary authorizations before we can directly participate to any ISO activity. And contrary to the Sensenelec, we have no access to an early warning system of new ISO standardization project. This is a privilege of uh, ISO member, uh, and we therefore um, only accidentally discover new standardization work, which uh, might be very relevant for the EU and uh, clearly very relevant for workers. 
whereas we understand the growing importance of international standards and uh, we believe very much that those standards have a potential to improve safety and well-being at work. At the same time, uh, we think that uh, standardization driven by private actors without uh, appropriate involve involvement uh, of, for example, the ILO, lead to the potential to circumvent and even to violate labor legislations, collective agreement, and uh, the issue of the right to bargain collectively. And uh, indeed, to set standards in issue that are the uh, uh, exclusive competence of the EU or the exclusive competence of social partners. It is clearly for us the red line that the EU should draw when it comes to uh, recognizing uh, ISO standards uh, in the uh, European Union. And one of these red lines should be for certain standards to uh, have the ILO uh, included. And I think here the ILO convention should be one of the uh, internal compass that the ISO should um, should respect and it has already been the case when uh, the ISO 26000 was set back in time in 2010. This is also why it is crucial to remain very vigilant as the Vienna Agreement for the transposition of international standards at the European level foresee a principle of primacy of international standardizations. The ETUC call here for the review of these agreements, so has to guarantee a robust control of legality and compatibility of interna international standardizations before its authorizations uh, and the application of those international standards at the level of the European Union and the national member states. And on these points, we clearly um, are uh, disagreeing with the position of SEN and Senelec. Some final words on harmonized standards. Uh, the ETUC believes that the control of legality in the harmonized standards areas offer advantages that should continue to be taken into consideration. And although the current consultant system can certainly be optimized to meet the demands of all stakeholders in the European standardization system, the ETUC support the review and approval by a democratically legitimized authority of the standards developed to under, underpin uh, legislations. The ETUC welcomed the initiative in the revised industrial strategy where the Commission commits to explore the merits of a legislative proposal for regulating key business services supported by harmonized standards starting with the assessment of the most pertinent business service area where harmonized standard could add value and to carry out of course a thorough analysis to the potential of harmonized standard to facilitate cross-border activity market potential and opening of an overall economic benefit including um, certain sectors uh, and certain uh, uh, constituencies and we welcome also very much that there will be uh, impact on working conditions and workers' rights that will be subject to a uh, thorough uh, considerations. And with those uh, elements, I would like to close my contribution and thank you very much for your invitations and for being a bit patient while um, I was given uh, access to speak uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now that the second panel is complete, we will have the closing remarks by Ms. Kirsten Jorner, the Director General of DG Grow. Please, Ms. Kirsten Jorner, the floor is yours. Don't forget to turn on the, the sound, please, the microphone.
Thank you very much. I could not unmute myself, so I needed the organizer to help me. Thank you very much, um, Presidency, for inviting me for this event. It's past, for me personally a great pleasure to address a standardization community again after uh, many years of abstinence, I have to say. And um, what I'd like to say about having listened also to your interventions uh, is that it's clear standards give wings. They give wings to innovation and they give wings for competitiveness of our companies. And at the moment we're standing today, if we look at the single market economy, we need standards, we need these wings more than ever. Uh, we just published the update of our industry strategy and we see a triple priority. The first is to make our single market more resilient. The second is to enable the green and digital transition. And the third is to solidify our supply chains and uh, look at the dependencies. We need the wings for doing all of this. Now, in your discussions today, um, we've asked the question, is the current standardization system, the European standardization system, fit for purpose? And what I heard is that the overall, you think it's the basis from where we have to start. But there are two types of issues that you've mentioned. First is, you know, the current, the day-to-day -day functioning of the system, where maybe, it's the yes but, where we could maybe improve when it comes to uh, the speed, when it comes to the inclusiveness, when it comes to priority setting. And when we look ahead, there are also challenges. So it's not only the, the daily management of the system, the running of the system, and how we work together in this public-private partnership. It's also how will we face the future challenges, which are geopolitical new parameters um, or the, uh, the need to roll out very quickly technologies that provide the solutions for the uh, decarbonization, the greening of our um, of our uh, production uh, and consumption patterns, or the digitization. What I uh, take away from the discussions is that we have to reinforce our partnership, and we have to reinforce our partnership to address these two types of challenges that you've identified. One uh, area where I, I clearly see need to reinforce our partnership is the global outreach. The, the green transition and the digitization have picked up speed and part of it uh, also because of the challenges of the, latest, of, the, uh, of the pandemic. They've taken up speed. So there is a need to roll out these technologies and the solutions actually that technologies provide faster and which means we need standards faster and we need to act faster and together at Europe at international level as well. And then there's the question of prioritization, which I would like to highlight. And I want to give you three examples why thinking about the priorities and how do we get ourselves organized to work on these priorities is important now. Um, and thank you very much, Presidency, for organizing this event, in fact, now. My first example is hydrogen. Uh, based on our hydrogen strategy of last uh, autumn and the Hydrogen Alliance, which now includes more than 1,000 companies, we have a massive, we will have a massive pipeline of projects to be ready to go for market uptake. And we need the standards uh, to allow this. Europe is probably the first, will be the first functioning hydrogen market. So that's a huge opportunity to set the benchmarks, to set the standards for this market. And uh, we just launched a call for proposals uh, for projects uh, for the Hydrogen Alliance. And we have a four digit number of project proposals just to give you 
an idea of the momentum that we have here. My second example is batteries. Now batteries, if you remember, we come from far because at a certain stage we had no battery production in Europe and we took the political and economic decision to, re to build a battery supply chain in Europe, a sustainable battery supply chain. And that has now really brought fruit and that is creating quite a momentum in Europe. So in the area of sustainable batteries and the supply chain for such sustainable batteries, we're again ahead of the game. So that's why we need the standards for that area now. And we have to work together to make sure that that happens. My third example is Gaia-X and uh, the data strategy of the Commission. Uh, it's about the EU data infrastructure. We need standards to see how on the basis of this infrastructure, the different databases and the components can communicate with each other, how we organize portability, how we avoid lock-in. That's again where standards can play a huge role. Now, what we announced in the update of the industry strategy is a new standard strategy that will address the issues that you have identified today, but that will in particular look forward at the challenges that we have until 2030 and 2050 and how the standardization, the European standardization can contribute to this. The European standardization in its organization is unique. You don't find a clone anywhere in the world. And uh, the, in particular, the cooperation between the, the, the legislator, the legislative side and the standard side is a pretty unique way of doing things. So let's leverage that system. Um, what we need and the consultations that we will conduct is to have EU, EU actors with a plan in the global standard setting context. We need EU standards for EU priorities. We need EU actors in the standardization system and EU standards to preserve the EU values. And the last speaker uh, mentioned that very clearly. So the EU values and interests. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to spread our wings and fly. And I'm looking very much forward to cooperation with you uh, in the build-up of the standardization strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are almost at the end of this conference. The closing remarks, the closing session, will be made by Ms. Ana Ramalho, member of the board of the Portuguese Institute for Quality. Please, Ms. Ana Ramalho. Thank you very much, Susana. Good morning. We have reached the end of our conference and on behalf of the Portuguese Institute for Quality, I would want to express our gratitude for the participation of all our excellent speakers who have contributed tremendously to the success of our event and the achievement of our goal, basically translated into giving voice to the decision makers on the subject of standardization and to establish bridges between all partners. We also want to thank everyone who signed up, shared and participated in our event. Finally, let me share a few words with you and underline that approximately 5,000 voluntary European standards support the implementation of European legislation and policies, providing market orientation solutions that enable compliance with legal requirements. In addition, these standards are regularly reviewed to take into account innovation and new technological developments, allowing legislation to be kept up to date when referring to standards. Timely and effective harmonized standardization in European Union is crucial for the competitiveness of our industry and for the maintaining of single market 
with a view to a robust recovery and competitive and sustainable Europe. I think today the importance of standardization in the European economic recovery has become clear. Thank you very much again for participating in our event and we hope to see you soon and continue working together. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.